you know, I can't guess because there's, I'm not going to guess. I, I, I never really count it up. They just keep going. I'm on a train. What? I'm on a train. That's it. The train's moving and uh, it makes a lot of stops and sometimes it changes direction. But I'm on this train and wherever it goes, anyway, it goes to the grave. But the train's been uh, interesting and rewarding and, uh, and I don't stop to think about all the stops I've made. Some of the places I've been, some of the things I've done, I think about. And how we move, progressed from one moment to another. time a, a baby with two heads was born and my father was sure it was me. My mother was always a character. I mean I remember coming home from college and she said this to me and she said have you been out on any dates lately? He said well recently I went out with Carol Fox. My mother says does she? <laughs> I smile for my mother is asking. <laughs> You just don't expect something like that from your mother. Do you remember Brooklyn? I, I, I do remember Brooklyn as a kid, but not as not living there. Um, since my, my mom and papa lived there, and my and my cousins lived there, we always made a trip every summer to um, to Brooklyn. And so I have very strong memories of going out to, uh, to Brooklyn and uh, staying with uh, Mama and Papa or Aunt Rose, Uncle Joe. My father had enough of New York. He was a Cleveland guy. He just needed to be back there. I remember being in a new home on Silsby Road in University Heights. In University Heights, 90% of the kids that I knew were Jewish. Uh, everybody around me was Jewish, so the whole world was Jewish. My whole, my whole world. Michael told me one day that Alice Neal looked at his work and said it's rather Talmudic or something like that. Isn't that right? I believe that's what, didn't she say that? Yeah, she said that. And uh, so what? I said, that's great. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, and uh, so I like the, I like the, 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 the I like the Jewishness of, of much of the work. Think about this pod, it's approximately 3,800 years old, roughly the time of Abraham. This is the Yakidah, the binding of Isaac, when Abraham offers his son Isaac for sacrifice to God, and um, an angel of God interferes and stops the sacrifice. In this case, we don't sacrifice our children over altars anymore, thank goodness. And this is a contemporary version of, of sacrifice. We are entrusted to have our children grow up as well as they can and, uh, and give them what they need. And all too often we have let other things get in the way of that important act of helping our kids. You were expected to be different. You were expected to be interested and, and have something to say. It was that belief in art, in making your mark, and having something to say, you know, and all this. It, it was almost like it was a religion. It was a set of values to live my life by. 
I, I think I really looked up to him, and I think there was, there was a bond that I think goes back to the studio. There was a bond through art. Fishing, too. We like, we like fishing. What's your picture of your father when you were a kid? Uh, loving father, that's all. Lo loving father who was busy with work. He had business concerns, wor worries, and I guess the name of the business was U.S. Utilities. There were maybe 10 salesmen, and they would load up their cars with merchandise, all kinds of merchandise, household goods, shirts, clothing, coffee pots, silverware, Bibles, anything that they had. I mean, they had a strange warehouse of all kinds of strange things in there. And um, these salesmen would go on the road all northeastern Ohio, and they would sell these things to the, to the customers for $2 down and $2 a week for the rest of their life. <laughs> this painting is uh, Life and Times of M. Stanley. My father didn't want to receive uh, nasty calls and letters, so he created M. Stanley to be the credit manager of his business. When I was in high school, I used to go and help out uh, and sign M. Stanley's name and send out all the Dunning letters and warning letters to people who didn't pay their bills. So one day I, I thought about this fictitious M. Stanley and I decided to construct a life for him from his arriving on the Stieglitz photograph working his way to the visit with the queen and the secret jello testing life in a fur shop reviewing the troops with the general Patton. and in the last panel uh, it's his retirement your whole life you've been collecting papers and they just sort of flow down on top of you the story goes that uh, i was in new york and we were um, we were in a delicatessen and I was trying to get one of the green cucumbers floating in the brine. And I guess I reached a little too far. And I went in head first into the pickle barrel. My cousin Morty saw this and saw my two Buster Brown shoes sticking out of the pickle barrel. And he reached in and pulled me out. That's a quirky story. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to be fitting, right? You would agree. There's something uh, yeah. fitting about it. Why is that? Yeah, that's quirky. I don't know how many people where their life has been in jeopardy or they're drowning in a pickle barrel. Probably not too many in the country. I'd be one, I'd be minority, I'm sure. <laughs> My father was a lot of fun and he was playful. There was always an embracing of what was different and unique. There was a celebration of that in, in my house. And, you know, growing up, we had all these weird objects, like a fetal pig in a jar or an antique razor sharpener. All of these weird antiques. It's a cystoscope, antique cystoscope. What's a cystoscope? It's to examine the inside of your bladder. <laughs> how, 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 does that, how does that thing work? It, you insert that through uh, your the penis or vagina. Either one? <laughs> that, that, that's a dual-purpose instrument? And <laughs> Have you ever tried it out? No. <laughs> this painting is the um, muse pays a visit and stops all the clocks and watches. We have a baseball team marching behind World War II soldiers. And we have the Russian soldiers doing sit-ups in a dark hallway, which looks very sinister. Tubercular children uh, sunning themselves for therapy reasons inside a gallery. I have wolves howling at a medieval torture item that they put the prisoner in and they hung them there until they died. But in every case, the muse shows up and makes the bizarre happen. How would you describe the way she looks? She's, she's, a, she's a crone. She's an old lady. She may be a witch. It's certainly surreal. So the concept of a muse with an artist is an old concept, right? Yeah, but sometimes the muse is a beautiful woman. In my case, it's not. She's not beautiful. The stereotype is a beautiful woman, right? Yeah, beautiful woman. I remember this artist uh, falling in love with his muse and, uh, and his sculpture and dancing with it. Uh, no, my, no, that wouldn't be the case. She's, she's wise and she's smart. She knows all the answers and, and she's supernatural. If you know, get up in the morning and you know that you're going to do a, you know, a particular track, you have an idea what's going to happen, you've been thinking about it during the night, and you sit down in the studio and start to do this, 
and somehow the voice shows up say, uh-uh, don't go that way. This is what you have to do instead. Even though you're fully intent on going, going ahead, when that happens, I listen to her. If you had a look back on your life, yeah. if you had a pinpoint, uh, psychologically, connect that to a person, who was the critic in your life? Me. You. Me. And where does that come from? I'm the critic. I'm the toughest critic. There's always people, you know, people either respond to my work or they don't respond to my work. They, they care about it, they don't care about it. Um, I'm the hard-nosed guy who looks at my work and says oh, whether I'm successful or not and kick myself. I, occasionally I call myself a hack. He says, you're nothing but a hack. Um, I, I, sometimes I feel that way. What am I beating my head against the wall for? I should just, I should just stop. In one panel, I have a figure that's reacting to the whole painting itself by pulling out a pistol and shooting the painting. And you notice in one of the middle panels, you see bullet holes in the painting. I would like to know what was in your head when you did all this. I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, it's 1996. Um, I guess I, I was thinking very bizarrely and trying to create images that uh, were incongruous and uh, at the same time unifying. So they're both strange and um, unifying and also surreal. Contemporary surrealism of some sort. Is this the kind of soup that's flowing around in your brain? Yes. Uh, today, today it's more restrained. I, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I, I fo it's more focused, a little more disciplined. But I guess it wasn't so disciplined when I painted it. Do you like it? It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I guess uh, that it's who I am. I guess and who what I was uh, when I painted that. Do you think that to be an artist, you have to be a little nuts? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's not that. Why would anybody want to spend their life doing this <laughs> unless you had to do it? And that's the reason why I do it, because I have to do it. On a Saturday, for 10 cents, you can go and watch movies. I must have been in six and seven. And they were going to boil the Three Stooges in oil. This is all your fault, you pudding head. If it wasn't for you, he wouldn't have been in this spot. And I couldn't take it. And I ran out of the movie theater screaming. And I ran home. You were terrified? I was terrified. I would just, just say that I was um, a sensitive kid, I guess. My parents made a mistake. They, they set low expectations for me in the beginning. They said, all you need to do is get a C. So I didn't work very hard. I played a lot. And I was not particularly popular either. I, was, I didn't have a lot of friends. So I really had... A, to um, find a way to entertain myself. I drew in math class. I drew in English class. I drew wherever I could. Um, I was always drawing, nonstop drawing. Uh, and then I, I got into trouble doing all kinds of stuff. Um, when I was a little older, I learned, I tried to melt all my plastic toys, see if I could make something with molten plastic. I, I made homemade gunpowder as a, as a teenager and, and set it off in the basement in black on the ceiling. Yeah, probably the most foolish thing I ever did in my life. And it affected me the rest of my life and affects me now. Is that I went to a religious camp. And we were all having a kind of fun weekend. But there was one of the kids brought a starter's pistol to the camp. And a starter's pistol uses 22 caliber blanks. And this kid rejected one of them that didn't work. And didn't didn't fire. He was firing them, and they'd make a loud noise. So he rejected one, and I picked it up. Uh, and I looked at it, and I said, "Everybody's quiet now." And I took a thumbtack, and I put in the tip of the of the, of the little cap. And I thought, "Well, I'll drop a bed on it." We had steel bunk beds. So uh, I did. The copper exploded in multiple directions, 
and, and it hit me in the cheek, and it hit me in my eye, and penetrated my eye. I spent the entire ninth grade in the hospital. I had a lie with sandbags against my head so that my head wouldn't move. And there was a Band-Aid on the ceiling that I was supposed to focus on the whole time. I had a radio for companionship, and then the most important thing I had is my mom came to see me every single day and stayed late. My mom got the class assignments, and she read The War of the Worlds to me, and I would talk a book report, and she wrote it, and she got me through ninth grade. That's all right. I don't have to point to it. You can see it. Can't you? Yeah, we can see it. And um, can you see anything out of it? No. Uh, has it affected my art? Um, I have, it happened so long ago that I don't know. So I, I assume it has. Um, maybe even for the better. <laughs> It may be even that allowed me to see a flat plane better than, than other people have. The osteogenesis of an infant skull is an incredible, mysterious happening which interests me. Bone is produced on the external surface of the skull by a cell called an osteoblast. Thus, the skull becomes thicker and grows larger. If this were the complete genesis, the seven-year-old child would have skull walls over two inches thick. This does not occur because of the presence of another cell located on the interior surface of the skull, called an osteoclast. This cell destroys bone. This keeps the cranium walls at an even thickness as it grows. My senior year, I decided to take a class with the renowned Morris Weitz. His classes were really hard to get into. He was an extremely popular teacher. And Morris Weitz had an amazing ability to be the, the philosopher that he presented. So when he presented Aristotle or Plato, he became Aristotle or Plato. And he argued the argument as if he were that person. The, the main thrust of the class was to determine what is art. New paint flows over old paint. New ideas over old ones. New training over old training. When it comes to look at these things like a whitewash applied to an old fence, the old things are dead. They are covered up. This is not altogether true. The past is like an osteoclast, which is a living thing, although somewhat obscured. The old idea modifies the new idea. Memories of childish dreams come into being with the tripping of some unknown stimulus lever. Memories of people who I have known come alive and join the people who are around me. Past feelings of guilt, exultation, sorrow, anxiety come to flow in the present tense. We get through the entire class, and he's got room for one more philosopher. And who is it? It's Morris Weitz himself. He is going to present an argument from his perspective. And he has an interesting argument. And the argument is, in order to define anything, you need to give both the necessary and sufficient properties of whatever you're defining. So if you're defining apples, you put a parenthesis around apples, and it prevents bananas to be part of that definition. It is an exclusion. So if you define art by putting a parenthesis around it, you're closing off all incoming ideas of what art is. Well, it was a wonderful argument, and I bought it, milk, line, and sinker. The parent of the human being is one microscopic speck, the fertilized cell. The whole human body is the progeny of this one. It becomes two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, and 1,000 billion. My painting, like the fertilized cell, does more than exist by itself. It provides for the future. Cumulative knowledge from earlier paintings is heaped up in my mind so that a freshly gessoed canvas is not a blank. Now, 
I went to Cranbrook Academy of Art. Cranbrook was a true academy. It was an academy because the professors themselves chose their own students. And so just as easily as they can select in, they can select out. And there were students who got kicked out for various reasons. I go to the beginning of class, and there's no class. First week goes by, no instructor. Everybody's working. So I worked. The second week, you know, no one showed up. Two weeks, I haven't seen the professor. After the second week, Donald Willett walks into the class, and he comes in to introduce himself, and, uh, and we, we do some small talk, you know, where are you from, that kind of thing. And, and then after the small talk, he, he hits me with, well, what is your definition of art? Of course, right after Morris White's, I was, I was like ready for that question. I, could, I was ready to go with that one. And I gave him Morris White's just like that. And as I was talking about necessary and sufficient properties and closed parentheses and exclusion and all those things, I can see his face turning red. But oblivious to that, I just kept going. And I can see the steam coming out of his ears. And I just kept going. By the time I delivered the whole story, he, he, was, he was on fire. And he said, Fenton, you believe that? And I said, yeah. And he says, you get the hell out of the school. So two weeks into the school, and I'm thrown out. The cells of the various parts of the systemized assembly assume special shapes, octagonal, stellate, and thread-like, as the case may require, pour out cement which binds, or fluid in which they move free. Some will have changed their stuff and become rigid bone, or harder still, the enamel of a tooth, or some become fluid, so to flow along tubes too fine for the eyes to see. Some become clear as glass, some as opaque as stone, some colorless, some red, some black, some become inert as death, some become engines of mechanical pull, some scaffoldings of static support, some a system transmitting electrical signs. The pigment runs down my canvases, but it never runs down the same way twice. My interest in biology shows itself in my work. As an undergraduate student, I studied medical illustration, which entailed anatomy, histology, zoology. Having gained the scientific background, I found that this involvement was not satisfying enough for lack of being creative. This explains why I'm a painter, not a biologist. He walks out of my studio, and I see him at the main door. And he turns back to me, and he stares at me, and he says, see me in the morning before you go. I didn't sleep that night. I said, what on earth did I say to really tick this guy off? And so I thought about it. My purpose was to find out what art was for myself. Morris Weitz was an esthetician who needed to find out a, a, a philosophy that fit lots of people. But I was an artist, and I had to learn to find out what art was for me. And if I didn't know or have one, I had it work to find out. I went very humbly to uh, Donald Willett's office in the morning, and I apologized. And I told him that I understood why he was angry. And, um, and, I, I, and I, well, I graduated. I've attempted to show a pertinent kinship between my paintings and its influence. But to claim knowledge of all the reasons for painting or all the relationships that my painting possesses would be unfair and foolhardy. However, to disregard this kind of analysis would be a paucity of thinking I'm a part of myself. There you have it. 1967, thinking of a 25-year-old. I was a young Turk. <laughs> I, was the, uh, I was the bull in the china shop. Uh, I did what I wanted, I said what I wanted, I painted what I wanted. I was going to uh, turn a page in art history. 66, Cleveland Museum of Art, May Show. I was well, still a student. So while you're a student, you're showing in a museum? Yeah. A major museum, right? Yes. Major museum, big museum, big time. To be, to be somebody in Cleveland was, was something. You know, people knew who I was. I remember going to a department store and the, the clerk knowing who I was. It was that kind of thing. Uh, this is a bulletin from the Cleveland Museum from 1967. 
And it's just, it's a listing of the paintings that were purchased that, are, uh, uh, that year. Yeah. These are the paintings they bought. Uh, they, bought a, they bought a Rembrandt. And they brought uh, Van Rysdale, several of them. Uh, they bought a Pablo Picasso. And they bought a Michael Fenton. I couldn't imagine any time there would be a list where I'd be included with, the, with the, the greats like that. But there it was, 1967. Violent refers to life. And morphic means shape. This painting is called Portrait from Grey's Anatomy. This one is Fleshy Remnant, a series of triangles which form a larger triangle. Worked surfaces, uh, abraded surfaces, taking away is just as important as adding. I was interested in the surface and the breakdown of this. I was looking through a microscope at a moth wing, and this painting is called Moth Wing and Twin Cylinders. Biomorphic orbit. Now, these are extremely uh, suggestive of legs and uh, you know, intestines, but it's not exactly the, the body part. It's a suggestion of one. This one is Portrait of Midge. This is more overt. It's an abstract image but it's totally made up of body parts of, of Midge, who is a model. You create a space that looks like it exists in a three-dimensional world, and then you put things in it which are non-objective. You're saying that these things belong in this space, and it creates some tension between something which is understood and something that's just not necessarily understood. And so I think that tension is interesting. Teaching is something I, I enjoy doing, but it's a learning process. And you just do it. Over the years, you get better at it. Things were moving along. I got a job at Cooper School of Art. It was a good experience. But at the end of four years, I decided to take a chance and, and teach at Kent State University on a one-year sabbatical replacement job. It was a year after the tragedy at Kent State. So where, where the students got shot and the National Guard was called out. So it was a tough year that year with, uh, with police and uh, all around and FBI agents around. I had the opportunity to teach at Kent, and then that led me to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. The students were so motivated. I had some that sold their blood in order to buy the materials. They had that kind of level of intensity. It was a powerful school. We moved to Saratoga and we bought a, a Victorian mansion that had seven apartments in it. And uh, we lived in the, the main floor and we became landlords. Uh, I rode my bike to, to uh, classes. Skidmore gave me a wonderful studio to work in. And uh, I worked and I taught and I enjoyed my classes. I mean, how can you not look at that list and say you were on fire? You were on fire, right? No, I wasn't on fire. I was making progress. I was doing well. There's a solo show at the Cincinnati Art Museum. I had the show all by myself, you know, in a, in a major museum. I had, a, I had a solo show at the Maslin Museum of Art in Maslin, Ohio. It's a small museum, but I was having a, a solo museum shows. <laughs> Uh, so things started to start off pretty well. I don't say it was on fire, but I was saying I was making progress. What would have been on fire? Oh, I don't know. I mean, what, I don't know. what, what more would you want? I don't, I don't know. I was, I was happy. I was happy with my, my progress. And you were getting attention from critics, right? They were, they, I was getting reviews. The show I had in Chicago I had, I had terrific reviews. What show was that? 
the Michael Wyman Gallery. That's where I sold half the show. There was a lot of development going on in early in my career that when I came to Saratoga seemed to slowly dissipate. This is Seed of Abraham. This painting is about the um, horrors of the Holocaust and the, and the history of anti-Semitism. It was the first painting that I did after years of making abstract painting and that was a narrative form. It was the juncture in the road where I made a, a, a turn. I taught at Skidmore for four years. I enjoyed it very much. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get tenure. Students were upset. There were banners hung across between buildings, keep Fenton, which was very nice to see, but it had no, uh, no effect. At the time, I thought we can do fine, make paintings, maybe have a shot in New York. I can remember one time down in the city, going around from gallery to gallery to gallery. Of course, the better part of a day, Michael and I, I went with Michael, oh, geez, I don't know, we probably went to 15 galleries, I suppose, at least a dozen. And Michael uh, had his portfolio with him. He also had an example of his work. And I was just along to help schlep things and uh, just be a, a friend. So I'd kind of stay out of the way in the galleries. But it was an interesting experience. It was interesting for me to watch because what Michael would hear from gallery uh, uh, owners or at least directors in the gallery, they'd look at his work and... Uh, uh, Commonly, they would sort of try to blow him off a little bit, but then they'd start to look at his work and it would capture them. And so I could tell in cases where they would think, oh, I'll give this guy a couple of minutes, you know, send him on his way. And then he'd start to look at a few works just to dismiss him and then get interested in it and say, oh, wow, that's really good. That's really good. The, 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 but at the end, they would say, but it's not what we handle. It's not what our gallery does. I uh, wish you the best with this. Your work is really interesting. But we can't, we can't take it in here. And so th th there's that problem. An accident just occurred off the side of the painting. Somebody fell down, the bicycle wheel is spinning, and, and nobody's paying attention. Sometimes I just can't get it. And it's OK, I know I, I will. Uh, I think I can film this, though, you know, private no, company. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not filming it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought you pushed the button on the, on the audio. Anyway, I, I was thinking about last night, and the way that your questions were really led us down a path, and I'm not sure that's the path I wanted to go, because it really was more positive than negative, so... Um, I just think we need to make sure that's covered. And maybe maybe I would feel differently if I saw the taping, but believe me, I'm not going to sit through all that crap. <laughs> well, I don't want to exaggerate, but I don't think I have to. I, there was this constant tension between art and family, and it was a theme running through our lives, and it created real conflict. And I think that conflict is interesting and part of the story, particularly because of the setting. Mm -hmm. You came out of the 1950s. I did. You did. You did, Diana. Uh, Born in 1945. <laughs> you came out of the 50s, and your idea of a husband was somebody who went to work and came home. And the idea of a wife was someone who stayed at home with the kids and raised the family. Well, it wasn't my idea. It was the way we were raised. Right. And, and I'm just saying that your life took a different path, and it was more complicated because of that. Were you hippies? Oh, we weren't hippies, but dad's acquaintances or friends from college. school, colleagues, were hippies. You always sat on the edge. You you always... You were there on the edge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think you thought you were missing something by our very... I kept him conservative, a conservative life. We both went to work nine to five, you know, so to speak, came home, had two children, and did the middle class thing. Whereas his friends <laughs> would invite him over for tea, and your friend's wife would come down stark naked, right? Uh, that's right. Dad would come home and tell me about these things. And, and I think that I really think you 
you didn't want it, but it was tantalizing. That you know, life. Yeah, that life. You really, for some reason, you were drawn to the middle class life or drawn by me <laughs> to the middle class life. But you, you didn't fight it. That's who I was. That's who you were. Right, but he kind of enjoyed knowing these people that lived on the edge, but you never really wanted it, or he didn't have the chutzpah to have that kind of life. <laughs> it was kind of fun going through his graduate thesis and cutting it together with the abstract work, and I really kind of enjoyed that process, and I, and I developed a new appreciation for his work. But then to now hit that moment where he doesn't get tenure at Skidmore, and his career starts to dissolve. And he leaves. This is the year I went away. I went away, and I went off to Indiana University, Purdue University, in Indianapolis. I left you, Mom, and Argus. And uh, it was a terrible time for everybody. Uh, I, I left because I. It was an opportunity to, to teach again, and they promised me that there would be a full-time job available coming up, uh, and that uh, if I took the part-time job, I'd have a good shot at getting it. So you came home from Indiana, you said, with your tail between your legs. I did. I had uh, the, the job, the job that was um, promised at the beginning it never materialized. So I had no, no benefit from my year away, and I had to do something. I could not be a gypsy attendant professor anymore. I had a family, and I had, a, I, had a, I had to take care of them. Well, if you want to save some money, get good quality and more. See the money-saving man at the money-saving store. Yeah, that's me, singing about Michael Fenton, the money-saving man at the money-saving store, Star Furniture Factory Outlet. And I'm here to tell you that if you buy anywhere else before you check with Star Furniture Factory Outlet, you're going to pay too much. I'm always going to shop the Atrium. What year was this? 1983 to 1985, because I finished it at home. So before you even knew that you were going to own a furniture store in a mall, you started a painting about the mall. Yeah, well, I, I, I finished it at, pretty much at Indiana, and I was not real happy with it. And, and so it, it lingered here while I was at the mall. Maybe I wasn't happy about my life then at all. So it maybe this reflects that. And why I didn't like this painting so much is because I hated my life then. So maybe that's the reason, the psychological reason. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. You don't even like to hold it. In the beginning, uh, it was not a terrible thing because it was a creative act to build something from nothing, build a business from nothing. And so I didn't mind it so much. But after it was established and after it was moving along, I hated it. And it wasn't very long before I hated it because I didn't like what it did to me. I didn't like the fact that I started to see people as targets rather than as people. I, I needed to make sales. We have this expensive home, and in it is a Poussin painting, the selling of the golden calf. In this panel, we actually have the golden calf, and it's for sale too, and it's got a price of uh, $92,000 for the calf. I painted this salesman who was selling the golden calf, and he had a contract in his hand and, and offering you a pen to buy it. Now, everything's a commodity. This painting is not an exception, so this painting is for sale for only $35,000. You can have that. It's raining credit cards on us. Dollar bills are everywhere. And then even the women. If you have this kind of money, you can have the women that you want. The women become a commodity. So we have this sofa, which I call chamomile silk, $34.99. And then I have Camille silk, who was 34. Then you can have B, C, or D, your choice of women. There's such an emphasis on, on, on shopping and buying and, uh, and, and purchasing and malls and, and credit cards that um, some of the more important aspects of life, you know, like 
caring for individuals, caring for people, uh, get lost. The conflict came from being able to do your art and financially support your family. And I remember my father kind of becoming hardened and tough, you know, when he was at the furniture store. He was really unhappy. If somebody came to him and said, you have to make a choice, you must make a choice, he'd give up art, as hard as that would be. There was two years when my father was at the furniture store that he didn't paint. It was the only point in his life where he wasn't able to make art. And I think it made him miserable. After five years, I knew I had reached my limit. You know, bankruptcy followed, but it was like a giant weight lifted from my shoulder. It was, it was gone. There's been its ups and downs, and it would be a shame if it had gotten all cast away over some stupid thing. And I've said to Dad, you know, it's really good that I always say he had the commitment and weathered the storm because we wouldn't know what we would have missed. When my father was 25, he was heading out into the world fearless. You know, he thought he was gonna make it. But when I was 25, I felt like it's, it's probably not gonna happen for me. And I think I've, approached the world and approached my work assuming that I'm not going to be successful. And I think it comes from watching his career fall apart. I'm braced for disappointment and my family was always braced for disappointment. There was always a job opportunity, you know, this could work out, this could be really good, you know. Or there was a gallery, there's a show, and it was gonna work out, and it was gonna be great. But then something would always fall through at the last minute. You know, the whole idea of the Fenton curse. What is the Fenton curse? <laughs> uh, the Fenton curse is that if there is a winner and a loser, uh, in, in, in something, it won't be the Fenton who's the winner. It will be somebody else. The Fenton is, is that if you come real close to getting something, you won't. Some, it just won't happen. Um, I guess that's the Fenton curse. This Guna was a, a very positive experience. I enjoyed teaching there. It wasn't college teaching, but it was high-level teaching. I had a really nice eight years there, and it followed with were a period of schools that were just low quality, um, not much going on, and then one that was in the basement. Sunday drive through the hood, went towards the end of my teaching career, and I taught at a school where a judge said to these students, either they go to school or they go to jail. There was a guard posted outside in the hall all the time. One kid attacked me, uh, and I had two students who were killed in that class. Anyway, it was a very tough year. I, I did manage to get through the year, but I couldn't do it again. But every day, I had to drive through um, the hood, and I, I took some pictures, and then somebody raised their voice at me, don't, you know, like, Dad, don't do that. And then I, then I was back at school, I got word, don't do that again. And I sensed that there were two worlds separated by a car door. I went in there originally thinking, well, gee, if I can save somebody, it'd be great. If I can just bring one kid around to uh, appreciate and make, make art, uh, it'd be a wonderful experience. But I, I couldn't even achieve that. I couldn't bring one kid around to make art. So obviously this part of the film is the most difficult to work on. I mean, I, maybe the end it will be, but but I don't think so. All those people who are 22 and 21 years old 
and they were ready to hit the world. They now had children that age. Life had gone by quickly. The vitality of a certain age versus the, the, the here and now. Now the color's uh, gone because you have the fall and the apple trees are ready to pick. Uh, approaching winter. This one's pretty beat up too. Good. Yeah, it, it's it's not quite that done. Yearbooks are not very intimate at all. They're just rows and rows of heads, and the pages take on a uh, a look of a page rather than a look of individuals. So the idea of blowing it up really big became important. I can only get one or two panels in the studio at one time, but I needed to be able to see the whole thing, all 12 panels. And so I built an armature that extended the whole 15 feet. It was a um, device that fit in the hallway, it blocked our bedroom, and it blocked the room where my wife had her clothes. And in order for her to get her clothes, she had to physically remove the panel and walk through the middle of the painting. It's, it's a cumbersome and difficult to exhibit and show, and now it's in my attic. Question for you. Yeah. What the hell am I supposed to do with all those paintings you made? That's going to be your problem. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with them? Uh, what do you think I should do with them? I think that when I'm, you take with the ones you want and sell the rest of them. How do I do that? Uh, uh, yard sale. I don't know. Give them away. Just put them out in the world. No sense, no sense in storing them. Give them to people. Sell them, sell them for pennies on the dollar. Fire sale. <laughs> in the late 60s, I, I made this nose machine. Uh, and it was a vending machine where you uh, put in a nickel and uh, it would vend three cents. You know, you think about it, a machine which it takes your, your five cents and gives you three cents. Isn't that the American way? <laughs> The apples are on the ground, and uh, they don't look too far from the tree. <laughs> well, that's true about you and me, buddy. <laughs> that's what I was getting at. What do you think of it? I think that's uh, pretty neat. That's, um, I, I just think about when, I, uh, when you came into the studio and you were a little boy and coming out of kindergarten and you had a half a day to spend with me. Uh, and I set you up in a drawing table, and uh, you went to work, uh, and I painted. And that was that was pretty nice. And I guess the results are you're um, doing what you're doing. So it doesn't matter what materials you use to make art. It's uh, it's the art. Anything brushes are almost archaic. Today's world is different. It's not about uh, the virtuosity anymore. Nobody cares about skills or craftsmanship. It's not important anymore. And I was just thinking about bringing Abraham's choice and make it pertinent to, to the rest of our choice. Underneath all this is Abraham offering his son for a sacrifice. And of course, the hand of the angel is uh, swooping down and stopping Abraham, and uh, he's dropping the knife. There are very few times in life that there is an ultimate choice. And, and, and you, you see that the uh, ultimate choice leads one to the way they live. The street artist made a choice somewhere along the line is doing this, uh, this lovely work that's on, on the street. And the first time it rains, it's gone. It's done in chalk. So his effort is done primarily for the moment. Since you like the Bible so much, I thought I'd go get a shot of an apple. That's a misnomer. It was just a fruit. When people started making images depicting Adam and Eve, they decided to make it an apple tree, I guess, it, it made sense to the artist at the time. But it uh, didn't have to be an apple tree. There's no mention in the Torah about what kind of fruit tree it is. Artists have always played an important role uh, in being a, kind of a nerve ending of society and being able to uh, make other images. Who, what other kind of images were there? Only the artists made images. There's nothing else. There's no TV, no radio, no 
It's the only way of communicating was on, the artist in the cave made an image of, on the wall. And we've been continuing to do that. Now, technology has changed, and so making art has changed. But there's still the artists who are the nerve endings of society and react to what's going on in the world. This is painted during a time when suicide bombers were hitting Israel with regularity. When you looked at the newspapers, you always felt that something that was happening over there, over someplace else. So I decided to make a painting in an American restaurant. What if we had suicide bombers in this country? What would it do to this country? We have a young couple, and they're en enjoying a conversation. She's laughing at something he said. The scene in front looks like a birthday party for a young child. We have a young lady waiting for her date to arrive. Things you would see in a restaurant. But hiding behind a pillar is a suicide bomber. The only person who's privy to this is the bartender in the back. He sees what's going on and he drops a glass. The suicide bomber is about to change everything. And this is the moment before. I had very high expectations in the beginning of my life that I would turn a page in art history uh, didn't happen. But it's, it's less important today. It's more important that I produce what I need to produce and make what I need to make. And it's, it's the, uh, the, uh, the, the process of, of making art for my life, for the long haul, that's been important. I think it's an ambition of a young man. We all have that ambition. I think most young men have that ambition. I want to make my mark on the world in whatever field. And um, I, I think it's healthier as we grow older to say, I do what I do, and I do the best I can at what I do. If it happens to have a broader influence, that's cream, that's fine. But if it's just I'm doing the best I can, I'm, it's like living your life. I live my life the best way I know how, and in hopes that it'll have uh, an impact on somebody. I think uh, whatever whatever's inside of us, I, I believe, see, I believe in the spiritual world, and I think that uh, the spirit of Michael's paintings touch the walls, the ceiling, the hearts, the minds of other people. Gilgul, it's a Kabbalistic concept that it has to do with the transmutation of souls. When the people die and their soul goes to heaven, if they haven't, if they haven't done what they were supposed to have done, then they, they tend to go back, but they can go back at any point in any time. It's an um, interesting phenomenon. It's one that I entertained with a whole series of paintings. This was the first of the Gilgal paintings. In this instance, I took the painting of the rape of the Sabine women by Poussin and brought them together at Jones Beach. There's this very banal scene, but under the surface is this dramatic rape scene. Do you like the painting? I do. This is one of my favorite paintings. The combination of something that was very ordinary with something very dramatic almost right under the skin, only we can't see it. It's just right there. It's very surreal and very interesting to think about this, that time, from God's point of view, is all happening at, at the identical moment. And that depending where we are, from our perspective, we only see one linear development, but maybe God can see it all in front of us because it's all happening at the same time. My father has left his marks in those paintings and those paintings will live on for a very long time, long after he's gone. Uh, I know that Picasso died at 93 years old and he was still painting. I mean, I, I prefer that narrative than the one where Duchamp, at the height of his, his fame, has uh, retired to play chess. He says, I made all, all the art he intends to make. Well, that's not me. I think that he'll work until the day he dies. I really do. Probably on that day, he'll be painting. Mark my words. This painting is Esau and Ishmael. 
And it was done uh, after a trip to uh, Israel and Jordan. And gradually, as I painted it, I began to realize the timelessness of the whole space and of the characters themselves. Outside of the fact that they're smoking a cigarette and he's got a watch and the power line's running through the painting, it's the same as it was 3,800 years ago. So I, I gave them the biblical titles of uh, Esau and Ishmael. Do, do you think it's possible that your paintings will make their mark in art history after you're gone. Well, at the end, you know, there's that's also the narrative of uh, Van Gogh, who uh, only sold one painting to his brother. Uh, it's all as far as he knew what, what happened to his work. People will tend to judge if you're a successful artist by how much you've sold. Michael and I talk about it, and it's more what we do and how successful we feel each work is, and that it's important to us not to necessarily create a saleable object, because that would be easy enough. We both have the skills to do that. I could make pretty little figures that would sell like hotcakes, and he could paint pretty little paintings that would sell like hotcakes. But when you throw content into that, and you sometimes have difficult content, then you're doing something that's, that you feel is important in the larger sense. In other words, it has a larger value, and that if people were to really look at it and try to understand it and spend the time with it, they would be um, open to something that they hadn't been open to before. They would experience something that they hadn't experienced before. I've always done what I wanted to do. I never jumped on any bandwagons. I, uh, uh, I always figured that if time you jumped on a bandwagon, you're already too late. I've just gone my own way. So if my own way is at, at odds with what the current scene is, that's the way it is. The attic is filled with my father's struggles. It's his legacy. And someday it'll be my responsibility to try to get these paintings out into the world. The idea that it might happen after you're gone, does that give you any solace? Well, that's, that's, that's the optimistic, uh, positive view, that somehow somebody will recognize what I've done as having some value and, uh, and, and raise it up to a point where it could be seen by many. Um, that's optimistic, but it's not necessarily realistic. Realistic is that there are lots and lots of artists out and lots and lots of artists who will never uh, be noticed. And only a few will. That's the realism of it. We disappear, you know, as human beings. I mean, we may be remembered for a generation or two, but then we're a distant memory. Um, immortality is somewhat of an insane idea. You kind of look like Rembrandt, but I'm sorry to say it's as far as it goes. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many good moments. There, the example, I have such a good time when I go to the Metropolitan, and I spend a day wandering through the galleries, visiting my friends. And by friends, I mean the great masters. I, I, it's just a lovely day. It's so, so beautiful. I enjoy it. It's a high point. It doesn't have to mean that uh, I sell a painting at the Cleveland Museum and that was a high point too, but I can't say that's it, the point where, of my life where I sold a painting to the Cleveland Museum. No, I, I have high, there are highs, there are lots of highs and there are lots of good times. What is your definition of art? <laughs> I, 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 I don't have a, a nice, clean definition that I can give to you like Morris White's did. It, it, it's, it's a pursuit of something much higher and more nobler than, than, what, than, than anything can imagine. That it, there's no ceiling on it. There's just only reaching for higher and higher at, um, realms of, uh, of uh, uh, I don't call it beauty, but I would call it, because beauty is too, 
is the closest word I can come to. It's higher and higher realms of, 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 of poetry, and it's that reaching in that process that it is, um, is the making of art. The whole, it's not a thing, it's the reach, it's the, it's the method, it's the way, it's... And when you do that, uh, and you, you try to make art, you are an artist. So it is art, it's that process that takes a, a lifetime of reaching. My father's life has taught me that success and failure might not be as far apart as you think they are. So now it's up to you to decide. Has this film meant anything to you at all? Or am I a complete failure? What? Film. End it, end, end it now. <laughs> and in the end, does it really matter? Thank you.